Hello, friends. It's Matt with Book Brilliant. Today we have on Luke Pearson and Jeff Durbin from Apologia Church in Tempe, Arizona. I This is actually one of my favorite uh, conversations, favorite episodes. Um, I just had a lot of fun talking to them. Uh, to be quite honest, um, I don't know. I was in a good mood. I felt pretty relaxed. They were pretty relaxed. Seemed like they were in good moods, and it just clicked. I thought that it was a really fun conversation. Um, Apology is involved in a lot of different things, um, so please check out the show notes to to see more about that, and I'll talk uh, more about it at the end of the episode, but let's get right to it. All right, guys. Again, it's great to have you today. Uh, first things first, I'm very concerned about getting a couple facts straightened out. Uh, Jeff, was your character Johnny Cage and Nightwolf in the 1996 Mortal Kombat live tour? Uh, Johnny Cage, Nightwolf, and Baraka. Ooh. Yeah, for the world, <laughs> Barack yeah. Obama. Barack Obama. Yeah, for uh, for the world tour, they cut the they cut the cast down to save money because it was so expensive to travel, and it was a huge, huge multi million dollar stage production. So they, uh, for the world tour, they had like us playing multiple characters. It was like a two hour long show. It was just ridiculous, all fighting the whole time. Sometimes we did like three shows a day. So yeah, like three characters per show. Sometimes that's what six hours of of show a day, a shows a day. Yeah, it was it was pretty brutal, but it was fun. Little known fact, I played Zangief. Zangief, nice. that's from Street Fighter, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, Street Fighter, <laughs> Street fri- Fryer, <laughs> Fighter. That's awesome. I didn't. That was a lot. Uh, what about the Ninja Turtles? What was that for? When you were, I think you were like Michelangelo and Donatello. What exact was that for? A movie or a show? Or what was that? For? It was uh, the franchise was doing a TV show. Uh, production okay. thing. So we, I did the work for the the choreography, the fight scenes, the stunts for Michelangelo, Donatello, and actually Casey Jones. Ooh, they, like to, they like Casey to save. Jones. They like to save money with stuntmen, and so they <laughs> make you you know play multiple parts. You know what I saw the story the other day? They had the remember the Ninja Turtle van, like the toy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They like a remaking. I saw it at the store the other day, and I almost bought it just because it was so cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those I did huge. It. I, I didn't. No, you're good. You're good. I didn't plan on asking this, but I'm going to now. Did you know that stunt guy that came out with that conspiracy video that was like a year or two two ago? Do you guys remember that? It was like a. What was it like a conspiracy of silence or something like that? Do you remember? You know what I'm talking about? That sounds vaguely familiar. I no I'm trying idea. to think. No, I don't think I did. It was yeah. It was like a stunt guy from Hollywood came out and was saying how everybody in Hollywood is. Uh, satanist and stuff uh, no i don't know the guy no all right all right yeah. well i like i said didn't plan on asking but thought i thought i'd throw that out there well i wanted to i thought of this question that i've been wanting to ask uh, different pastors and so you guys are the first people i get to spring it on so hold on are you wearing a hornady shirt yes nice oh yeah. i couldn't see the word i just saw the logo yep sorry it's actually Continue. it's actually the zombie tip uh shirt oh nice from, from their zombie tips Sweet. Very cool. All right. So, all right, here's my question. What non-salvation theological issue would you be most surprised to find out you're wrong about? What would have you in heaven being like, oh, I guess the uh, Methodists oh. had that one right. <laughs> like, well, I would never like, say uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that could be that won't happen. Stuff. I don't know. Uh, women's roles in the church, correct usage of tongues. Is there anything that that you that you think you have it such a good understanding of it that you would be totally flabbergasted? About Baptism. About? Baptism. I don't know. That's a good question. I've never. I've no never one's ever been, asked me that. Yeah, that's. Um, oh. I mean, I head we, coverings. <laughs> <laughs> no i'm serious i mean we I'm should sure. all we should all be like you know that sure about what we believe that we would be surprised if we were wrong so yeah and that's that's where i've i've tried to i've tried to contain myself into a place where i'm not going to hold to a position or put my feet down until i am very very confident that this is completely consistent it's throughout the bible and um and that's why I try to do. And I think we all would want to do that with our positions. There are certain, I guess, non, yeah, you said non salvific issues that are side issues. Like what would I be surprised about? Um, head coverings. Head coverings. <laughs> what was yours, Lou? Baptism. Baptism. You mean like the fully submerged in spring? No, or? I mean like uh, between the difference between credo and pedo. Okay. 
Okay. Well, that's good. I I thought for sure you, you guys, one of you was going to say um, how the world was going to end. Um, no, I don't see that as a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> to be wrong on that. I love it. I love. Actually, can we? I know that. You, okay, you've done this. Uh, you've explained this. I don't want to be. I, I was just say, Russ. I don't want to be arrogant about that and say that you know I have this perfect understanding, full understanding. I just mean thematically in scripture. I I can't see that as ever being um, anything else than it really. You know. So you is. would be surprised if you're wrong. I'd be shocked, yeah. but also I'd have <laughs> I'd have a lot of questions. Like, well, then why did you talk about it so much? <laughs> <laughs> right on your way up to heaven, be, yeah. getting beamed up. Yeah. Uh, I want okay, so the the whole premise of book brilliant, you know, is book recommendations from brilliant people. So anytime we can tie in a book recommendation, that's great. And I was going to ask you guys if you could throw out some books that people should uh, should maybe check out. Who uh, I think there's a lot of people that grew up watching the Left Behind series and Thief in the Night, and uh, you know who who believe that the Rapture has been what the Church has believed historically. So if you could give maybe a quick segment of why people should maybe rethink that and then just some books that they could follow up with. Um, I would love that. Well, I don't know if I can say a Not short, quickly. short yeah. way to <laughs> rethink it. Cause right. it would just be, let's get into the scriptures, but uh, books, books, I would say um, he shall have dominion by Kenneth Gentry yep. would be sort of an overview of old and new Testament demonstrating the kingdom of God as a present reality and the victory that, that God promises through the rule of Christ in this actual world, not just spiritual things, but in this world, he shall have dominion. Um, uh, I would recommend Dr. Bonson's short book if you wanted to get like a primer on it, and that's Post Millennialism uh, and Eschatology of Victory by Bonson. Um, and then if you're going to the side questions that arise from all that, uh, questions related to the Great Tribulation and things like that, I would get um, the debate between Tommy Ice and Kenneth Gentry. It's a, it's in book form as well. And that's the, the Great Tribulation Past or Future with those two authors. Um, it's actually from a debate that they did. Um, uh, the Last Days According to Jesus by R.C. Sproul. Uh, you can't do this without a study of the book, The Parousia uh, uh, by Russell. And um, uh, I'd say that'd be a good place to start. Um Days of Vengeance yeah. is a commentary on Revelation done by David Chilton. Wouldn't agree with everything he says in that book, but what you will see in that book will blow your mind and bless you and make you love the Bible a lot more. Um, that's a commentary on the on the book of Revelation. And of course, um, I have it. Uh, it's not released yet. Hopefully this year it'll come out. There's a two-volume set uh, from Dr. Kenneth Gentry on the book of Revelation, his commentary uh, I believe it's called the divorce of Israel. I think that's what he went for, and um, and that that's that's excellent. And that would be a book series you need to get uh, by the end of the year because I think that'll probably be the most substantial contribution um, in the light of all of Christian history and all the all the con all the contributions that have been made on the Book of Revelation. This this would be, I think, the most substantial for our generation. Paradise restored. Paradise well. restored will blow your mind. Yeah, yeah by David Chilton. That's awesome. All the all these books you guys reference will be in the uh, show description for the people who are who are new here. Um, I've always wanted to ask you guys because I think you've you've mentioned it before, but I always. Wh what's your favorite Bible translation? What's your go-to? ESV. 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 Yeah, that's a heretical translation. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> no, I got an ESV right here. Um, I love the ESV. Um, NASB is great. Yeah. Um, Honestly, the one that I actually enjoy reading the most in English is the uh, it was the Holman Christian yeah. Standard Bible. Now it's just the Christian Standard Bible. I think that the way that they sentence, or sorry, the structure, the sentences, they structure the sentences like we do today, and so it, it feels a lot easier to to get through and read because they they do everything in modern form and uh it's it's wonderful and i do like that they kept the name yahweh in some places and they use the name messiah i wish they would have just done it consistently across yeah. the board uh but at least they tried to put it some places and i do like that if james was here he would say i don't need translations yeah james is he just reads from the <laughs> greek and he, he just he just translates it on the fly yeah. mm. true story yeah you know what? I've had, I got some family members down in the South and, uh, they, I had my first ever kind of, I guess, run in with, uh, King James only people. Um, it was like a sister-in-law was down there and was being criticized because she, she wasn't reading King James only. 
So I told her you need to read, uh, you know, the King James only controversy, uh, by James White. So yes. that's right. That's wild stuff. Um, all right, here's, here's another one for you. Cause I, what do you guys think heaven will be like? And what do you think oh, hell man. will be like? And <laughs> here, here's the thing is I'm gonna let Jeff take this one. Okay, cool. Because when I read the Bible, I don't know if, I don't know if, um, if God is too concerned about us knowing exactly what it's like, but I also, uh, could be, could be understanding it wrong. So I'd love to get Jeff, um, your take on that. You yeah. just taught on this recently, didn't you? Yeah. Somewhat recently. I'm uh, wrestling with this a little bit in my mind. That's why I'm having Yeah. It. Heaven. Uh, okay. It depends on when. So the question would be when that like, you know, when someone says what's heaven like, I'd say when, uh, now or, you know, after the resurrection, because I think what's popular in modern Christian culture in terms of our thinking about heaven is, is that God sees this earth as sort of like a wasteland. Uh, it's going to the dump. It's, it's sort of a throwaway. We need to escape out of this world and get to that higher spiritual plane, that heavenly place, that spiritual place, because that's where things are really at. And that's how things are supposed to be is get into this sort of escape your body, leave behind your humanity and get to heaven one day. And uh, that's that uh, very Gnostic. It's straight up. Yeah, it's straight up uh, Gnosticism. And and uh, one of the things you see at the beginning of the Bible is, of course, the union between heaven, the spiritual and earth, God's presence with his people. It's a physical world, but there's, of course, spiritual components and realities. But heaven and earth are together at the beginning of creation. The fall enters in and God plans redemption. And the way the Bible speaks of our future is not this spiritual gassy experience out there somewhere in terms of eternally. But we're going to be living together with God in resurrected bodies on this physical world in a resurrected world. Um, heaven and earth will be united again in perfection. So someone says, like, what will we be doing in heaven? My, I often say, what do you like to do now? You know what I mean? Like, what do you, yeah. you, like, to, you like to swim in the ocean? You like to surf? You like to travel? You like to um, eat food? Um, what do you like to do now? Because God, you know, gave us a physical world and um, heaven and earth were together. Uh, in harmony, sin breaks that uh, relationship, but really the entire uh, story in the scriptures of like where the future is going, it's going back to a restored Eden. Uh, God is restoring what was destroyed in the fall. So like it's one of our famous songs uh, um, and it's uh, as far as the curse is found. Mm -hmm. He's coming to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Jesus is making all things new, not all new things. Mm -hmm. He's making all things new. He's bringing the resurrection, the renewal. And so um, what's heaven like? I'd say when. Uh, we just had a sister in Christ die last month. And for her, her experience of heaven uh, is very different right now than it will ultimately be. Because when the resurrection takes place of the just and the unjust and the final judgment, we're going to spend eternity with God in a physical cosmos together with heaven. And uh, so, you know, uh, I think that's amazing. That startles people sometimes when you talk about like that, because they're usually thinking about, you know, heaven being clouds with uh, babies with harps. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's very much this world resurrected the way things are supposed to be. And, um, you know, it, this isn't a throwaway. Sin doesn't enter the world and God throws away his original intention for man. Like that would be very disruptive to the redemptive story. Like, you know, I created you in a physical world, heaven and earth together, sin enters. So we're just going to throw that all away. No, we're resurrected physically. There's going to be an actual physical resurrection where you live on a physical earth um, for all eternity. So heaven will be very different now than, than it will be in the future. Ditto. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, shortly after I became a Christian, I was reading Frankenstein and I remember thinking like, I better finish this book uh, just in case the Lord calls me home because I don't know if this one's going to be in the library. In <laughs> um, so what about, uh, okay, to pause on that for one second. Um, I just met Erwin Lutzer this weekend. Luke, I was kind of oh, yeah, you told me that. about that. I don't know uh, if you guys are fans of it or not. I think he's a nice guy. Um, but uh, I bought his book, you know, One Minute After You Die or whatever. And I uh, haven't read it yet, um, but I know there, there's that book about heaven from, and I, I don't remember, I feel like the guy's name is Randy something. Alcorn, um, yes. Yep. I don't know if if those if there's any books on heaven that you guys have come across that have been helpful to you. No. All right. Well, that's um, all right. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and the thing is, is though, I think there's like, there's a, a, a level of caution that we should all have 
in areas where the Bible doesn't give you a lot of information. Like I think where God is, yeah. where God is clear and gives you certainty, I think you need to be very firm on that, stand on that strongly. But areas where God is like silent or he gives us very little information, I think you just be able to say, well, here's what we do know. But honestly, we don't know a lot. Like the God, the Bible doesn't speak, believe it or not, a lot about heaven. Um, in terms of yeah. what's it like and what right. will you be doing and those sorts of things. We know principles from scripture about the world and God and us and the fall and redemption. We know those things. And so you tie those things together. I think you can say with certainty, yeah, we're going to be living in resurrected bodies. That's a fact um, in this world for all eternity in this harmonious heaven earth relationship forever that we do know. But if someone says, well, what's it like? The be- Like I said, the best answer I can give then is, well, what's it like now? Now, yeah. figure that without sin. Figure yeah. it without sorrow. Figure it without pain. Uh, figure it without any animosity, any broken relationships. Figure it with perfection with God for all eternity and perfect fellowship and harmony with him and his creation and one another. And I mean, even imagine what's it going to be like in heaven with animals? I don't know. The Bible doesn't speak a lot about that, but it's going to be pretty awesome. I mean, to be able yes. to like hang out with lions and not worry about getting bitten or eaten. I love um, that, yeah. That's, that's an amazing thought. But like heaven yeah. now, what's it like? You have some scenes from the worship taking place in heaven, but that's not a lot of detail in terms of like, well, what's that really? What do you do other than just worship God before the throne? Like, yeah. I, yes, I want to spend eternity worshiping God. Every moment of that's going to be delightful. But you know what? God gives people gifts. He makes them artists. He makes them creators and dreamers. And there's times I think where we're not going to be necessarily just before the throne of God worshiping. I, I want that forever, but there's going to be times where like you're fellowshipping with other believers. I imagine you're going for a swim in the ocean. Like you're going to walk a mountaintop. Um, yeah. What kind of things are we going to do in heaven in the future? If we have an eternity, will we be exploring other planets in God's universe? It's a vast universe. Is that a possibility? Maybe. But again, this is all guesswork. I don't make, yeah, it sounds like that seems potentially like something that could happen. I don't know. Um, but what's heaven like now? Honestly, Jesus, here's where I land. Jesus says uh, that no eye is seen, no ear is heard, nor is it entered into the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. So all I can say is do your best to dream and you haven't touched it. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, so would yeah. you would you liken it to pre-fall Eden? Not heaven now, heaven in the future. Yeah. On earth. Yeah, that's what I would say. Um, but I think that like there's questions I have too about yeah. this. Like I don't even know like how to answer this. Like, what about all the structures on earth that have been built? Oh, good question. Like what's <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. we're we're gonna okay, like in how in, in heaven, Jesus says he, you know, he's preparing mansions. Yeah. Like, what well, okay, what exactly does that mean? And then like for eternity, like you, you're a skilled builder. Will God be like, Hey Luke, build, build this thing for me. And you yeah. just do it. Like that would be awesome. you just do it as an act of worship. And, I hadn't even thought about that. You know what I'm saying? Like you get to use your skills to build something for God. Yeah. He's like, build this for me. That would be and awesome. you get to do it in a way that, you know, that you just get to glorify and honor God, worship and use your skills and talents to build something for the Lord on his world. Yeah. Like I can imagine, like I dream about heaven, like somewhat, like even like you have eternity to perfect something like, as an artist, maybe you're a singer, maybe you know how to do certain instruments. Well, now you have all eternity to like sharpen that skill and like to do it without um, being prohibited by your own physical limitations, maybe here or, you know, anything. And you have eternity to like perfect your singing for God. And like, what are there, are there huge concerts like where people do their art to the glory of God as wow. a form of worship? Is that something that happens in heaven? I th- I think so. What about karate? That's yeah, like even like martial arts, like not the necessarily karate fight. Yeah, not like hurting other people, but like there's an aspect of the martial sure. arts that's just beautiful in terms of the human body and its form and like the like I'm talking about like katas and stuff. Like I am super passionate about that. I, that is my art. And yeah. I would love to perform that for God, for his glory, and to have all eternity to perfect that and do it in a way that actually brings glory to God and everybody enjoys together what God has made. Like I think about heaven in terms of that. And uh, you know, one sticky question that comes up about heaven is if we're raised in physical bodies and people just might disagree on this and that's okay. Cause I don't have certainty on it. Um, I just think that it fits together. People have, have 
have asked the question about like, will you eat in heaven? And I think there's evidence for the fact that you will eat in heaven, but I also, so. also God can, he created our bodies in the garden, physical <laughs> bodies in a physical world where heaven and earth are harmoniously together. And he creates us with a system with our mouth and chewing ability and uh, a whole system to, to basically uh, take care of food and expel waste. And that was good when he created it. And it was all there. The system was all there. Uh, God called it good. And so there's nothing bad about the digestive system. Mm. And so will you eat in heaven? I believe, yes, you'll eat in heaven, but like, well, will you, do you need your guts anymore? It's like, they did in the beginning of the world and God called it good. Right. And so people have a problem. They're like, you mean you'll like spell waste in heaven? It's like, well, well, what's wrong with that? When God created it, he said it was good. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, people, I think I, I laughed about this during the sermon, people think about that system of expelling waste and they've had maybe horrible experiences. <laughs> you know, we've all probably had horrible experiences at this point in our life. And so you're like, Oh man, that's how does that work in heaven? It's like, well, you're not going to have like the Taco Bell experience. <laughs> in heaven no you know stomach what I'm saying? it's There's not gonna no be like Bell in heaven Understood. yeah yeah so <laughs> like i i think that like you know when when we're res- when our when we're in our resurrected bodies do we eat well jesus ate after the resurrection he ate fish um yeah. and uh with Good the disciples point. so like you eat in a resurrected body there has to be a system to manage that right like you don't uh are we raising physical bodies where all of a sudden like our heart is gone our liver is gone our kidneys are gone our there's just an open cavity there or is the system good? God called it good. It's actually pretty spectacular. And it's also going to be fully in use mm-hmm. in a resurrected cosmos in, in eternity. I think so. I think there's evidence for that. Like I said, Jesus ate, physically ate fish in his resurrected body. So yeah, you eat in heaven. That's what yeah. I think. I grew up going to martial arts, you know, Jeff. And, and like, I always liked uh, grappling, kind of like with what you're talking about, how some martial arts are beautiful. And I'm, I don't know if people are going to track me on this, uh, if, if they're going to follow what I'm saying here, but I always thought it would be neat to to do um, wrestling, uh, grappling or wrestling with uh, with Jesus. I always thought that that would be a really... You know, uh, someone tried that once and they got their hip broken. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's the only downside. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I'm with you on that. Like, I hope we get to grapple in heaven because it's actually fun. Yeah, it's it's really fun. You can do it without hurting each other and just enjoy the relationship and like the struggle and like his com- competition. That's all it's like chess. Stuff. Yeah, It's like it's like a chess game. And like, what about football and soccer? Yeah. And like, I hope we're playing that in eternity. I hope so. Maybe we come up with a new game that's just awesome. Stinking oh, awesome. I, um, you know, Doug, I was listening to Doug talk about that recently. Doug Wilson, just how men are naturally created with that innate ability to just want to fight and wrestle. And yeah. Even like my nine month old, you know, I have two older girls and I have a nine month old son yeah. and he's already, he just wants to like, he just like digs his head into me and just like grinds on me. You know, my, my daughter's never did that. Yeah. You know, it's just this, this, this natural desire. He wants to just wrestle. Yeah. You know? He wants to wrestle, wants to overcome you. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, August is the same exact thing. He's yeah. a little toddler. He's like running, ramming his head into me and trying to take me down to the ground and like sit on my head and bounce. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, my girls didn't do that. That's for sure. That's kind of just like life on earth though. Cause if you watch animals, like animals play violence too, you know, it's like, if you watch two dogs, the way they play is by wrestling and I guess you could say violence. So, um, yeah, that, that's all interesting. All right. So what about hell? What, what do you think hell would be like? Don't know. We've been in gnashing of teeth. All I can do is <laughs> I, I, I think that, um, I've never really personally, I don't know about you. I've never really personally made like a, a very, concerted effort to like study the issue of hell yeah. to the degree that we're asking questions about like, what's it feel like? And you know what I'm saying? Like the, I guess the best way to describe it is it's clearly conscious. That's clear from scripture and all the texts we have. Um, people are aware of themselves and where they're at. It's gnashing of teeth. It's weeping. Um, Jesus describes it as a lake of uh, the Bible describes it as a lake of fire. Um, we then the story that Jesus tells people are thirsty. Um, and so that's the best I can say is I think it's worse than we think it is. That's all I could say. I'll say, I don't remember where I heard this, who I heard it from, but this really challenged me. My thinking on this was the whole idea of weeping and gnashing of teeth is I think we, I mean, I grew up, I think most Christians grew up thinking like when people 
you know, die. They're not saved. They wake up in their hell and they're like spend eternity, like wishing, you know, that realizing that they made a mistake and wishing that they hadn't. And, you know, and like I, someone described to me, it's the weeping national teeth. It's like people wake up and they're going to spend eternity mad, angry at God. Yes. They're not, yeah. they're not like repentant. They're not Correct. feeling bad for, they're like just spend eternity, just mad and angry at God that they're there. Correct. You know, and that really challenged my thinking on that when I, I can't yes. remember who it was. I know it, it's because of that, the Lazarus story where even after, even after the rich guy dies, he says, you know, why don't you have him dip his hand in water to cool my tongue? And it's like his behavior, even in hell, he's not saying, Oh God, yeah. I'm sorry or whatever. He's just saying like, Hey, that poor guy that I treated like crap, you know, my whole life, have him come back down here and do more stuff for me like that. Does that make, does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, like, yeah, and even, yeah, yeah. The, the, the fact that nothing is clearly changed in his own heart. He's not, he's not sorry about what he did to God. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's filled with people saying, you know, Oh, if I just would have had one more chance or whatever, I think it's, yeah. People who are, are still mad at, yeah. at God. Yeah. And they're, you're, um, you're now released to be what you've always wanted to be yeah. unrestrained. Exactly right. Like on God's earth, grace isn't there anymore. On earth, God's giving you grace. Yeah. God is causing the rain to fall on the unjust and the just. God is even at times with uh, stopping you from being as sinful as you want to be. Yes. Um, and uh, one thing our pastor says, Pastor James says a lot, is like, we don't thank God enough for his restraining of evil. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in hell, um, in that eternal state, there's no more restraining of evil. So what's that look like? probably pretty awful yeah but i don't have a lot of information on what that feels like and what are the details i do know that the popular sort of thinking of like the devil reigning in hell sort of that's like his spot he's sort of like the king over hell you know and and people got a are pitchfork and... people are gathered together no it's 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 portrayed as like eternal torment and darkness and fire and so I think it's very isolated and individualistic and Satan is also there. It was created, yes. hell was created for the devil and his angels. So he's there punished and suffering for eternity as well. But what's it like? I don't know, but probably pretty awful. Yeah, we've never been spiritually separated from God and that's essentially all that it is. So yeah, so yeah I asked uh, a Seventh-day Adventist that once and um, he. They, I don't know if this is what they all believe, but he has said, well, there, there's really no hell at, at, after Judgment Day. Everybody will get burned up all at once, and then they will just cease to exist. And I said, uh, I said, what about like Hitler? Like Hitler's going to have the same exact punishment as like the guy down the street who didn't believe in God. And he said, uh, some people will burn longer than others. <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> well, all he had. That's arbitrary. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just reading into the text. But yeah, that's a, that's a good point in terms of you know erasing somebody out of existence. Um, when you bring up an issue of like a Hitler or a Stalin or a Mao or anybody like that, I mean, you, you talk about the victims that they've created. Where's, where's the justice? Where's the cosmic justice in something like that? Um, yeah. in terms of just erasing somebody from existence. Um, I think there's problems there, but that would take us off into a big discussion. <laughs> well, let's hop into another big discussion here. Um, I want to hear what your guys' explanation is. And I've heard you talk about this before. I've heard it talked about on cultish. Um, but I didn't really walk away, I guess, with a very clear understanding of it. So I want to bring it up here. What's your best explanation for all the alien stuff that's going on? Right ah. now? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. it's fine. We've you you listen, how much time you <laughs> Jeff's gonna give you about an hour and more now. So uh he loves talking about this. Yeah. Would you say demons? I, I just, Luke, I've heard you say, well, yeah. you know, even if Christian said it's demons, that would be better than than just nothing. i I guess I've always I would chalk this is what I would say. I would probably chalk it up to two things, maybe government technology and the other aspect of it would be demons. That's the best I've got. I think that's hear what you I, no, I think that's great. I have a lot of questions in terms of how deep this rabbit hole goes. Um, I think that the the quick waving of the hand to these things is demons is we need something more substantial than that. Um, I think it's yep. important that we have something more substantial yeah. than that as Christians because what we have now with technology and the things that we're viewing and that we have footage of and radar evidence of, and we're tracking these things. I mean, you, you, when you talk about like UFOs or UAP, uh, uh, sorry, we're, um, 
um, underwater aerial, no, underwater, the, the underwater phenomenon. You, we don't just have stuff hap- as we're seeing in space or in our am- under our in our atmosphere in our area. We're not just seeing stuff there in terms of radar and our fighter jets even having it, viewing these things and and not able to chase them down. And they're doing things that defy the laws of physics. You're also you have to contend today with the fact that you have plenty of evidence of these underwater um, UFOs. We call them that. Um, where you have things that are defying the laws of physics through the water and submarines have had to contend with these. And Is that an Aquaman? Yeah, seriously. So we have evidence that, and, and plenty of solid evidence that there, there are these things. Um, people have interaction with them. Um, I think that there's, they are, there's evidence that it's clearly demonic um, in many, many ways, but and in what what this is the question I have with it that I'm still trying to work through a solid Christian worldview response with. In what ways are these spiritual creatures able to manipulate and utilize physical things? Um, I I don't know that we have all the answers to that yet, but I think we need to start working on them because what you're seeing. Great thing to point to is there's a there's a documentary. It's on YouTube. Um, I think it's um, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind or or something like that. Yeah. Uh, if the Fifth Kind, it's called. And what that is is like you go from the first kind, the second kind, the third kind to move your way into the the fifth kind, and it's you know actual contact and communication with. And so when you watch this documentary. You know, they believe that they're actual aliens and physical beings from another planet. And uh, they start giving evidence. The first, say, 20 minutes of the documentary is actually compelling because they bring up all of the actual uh, data and evidence that these things are interacting uh, with our with our uh, fighter jets and other things. You have all the evidence on radar. You have the evidence, visual evidence. Um, and it seems very scientific at first. You're like, this is very compelling. We do need to have an answer for this because this is this is real. It's real. Yeah. Um, and then it immediately switches and immediately switches into the occult and all the rest where it's like, now we need to start talking to them. And the whole rest of the show, yeah. it's as clear as a bell. I'm like, thank you for putting that on the record that that's exactly what's going on here. It's clearly occultism. It's clearly communication with demons. And they actually have, watch the video, you'll see it for yourself, the film. They actually have evidence, video evidence of them trying to do remote viewing and transcendental meditation and all the nonsense and they're actually communicating with these entities and they're able to, you'll see it on video. They held like a seance out in the middle of nowhere and they start communicating to these aliens from another planet. Then all of a sudden this orb shows up, like defies the laws of physics. You see it flying around and then comes towards them when they call it towards them and stuff. And so like, it's like, well, that's the same type of thing people say when they've seen UFOs, they've seen these orbs and these Mm. things that are defying the uh, laws of physics and gravity. Uh, But it's all for them occultism we can talk to these aliens now we can do it just with our minds and meditation and so i see that i go that's just more evidence for what we're actually dealing with but i do have questions (laughs) like say with bob lazar bob lazar i've been following his story for like forever yeah. And bob lazar has points of contact in his story to like reality and area 51 and all that it that that it's just it's hard i know that it's one man's testimony but the stuff that he comes up with is is hard to argue with in terms of like uh he's just lying i mean the man's not doing it for money he's not getting paid for this stuff he's vilified he was vilified very early on why would somebody take the kind of pressure that bob lazar took um and just be vilified uh, by everybody Didn't- didn't your dad either know him? Your dad worked on Area 51, right? So didn't he, did he know Bob or ever meet him? Um, but no, I, my dad, uh, my dad told me uh, maybe on two or three occasions that when, when I was born, I was born in Ellis Air Force Base. And while I was there, he was very early on in his Air Force career. Um, he worked at Nellis. He did logistics so all through his military career. He did logistics and uh, all the way up until his, when he retired, he in DC, he was doing logistics for Bill Clinton um, and uh, the, his air, air force one and stuff like uh, fuel logistical stuff for air force one. But in Nellis, when he was there, he was asked by his higher ups, like in logistics, how would you, um, how would you be able to like get money uh, and, hide it 
like for something we have over here? Like we need to, to fund building something over here. How would you kind of cook the books? It's not called laundering. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, my dad was in logistics and he was like, uh, well, this is how you would do it. Like if you needed to, you would just, you would raise the cost of these things. You would, you know, do the money this way. And they're like, thank you. Okay. We'll get back to you. And like weeks later, someone, he was called in somebody's office and the guy's like, we need you to do that for us. And so my dad would organize having trucks go out to the middle of the desert near area 51, uh, and guys drop off trucks and then, uh, walk away from them and get a ride back with, with someone else. And they would leave the trucks in the desert when they would, other people would come pick the trucks up and drive them to area 51 to build it out. But he said, then it wasn't called area 51. He said, they called it dreamland. Um, and, uh, (laughs) that was the original name. Turns out my dad told me that like when I was younger, it was called dreamland. And then I was watching a documentary on area 51. It's the first time I heard it. They were like, well, actually a technical name for it is dreamland. And I was like, Whoa, my dad was telling the truth. So it was just for a couple of years, he helped to whatever they were doing to build stuff out there. So all that to say, like when you hear someone like Bob Lazar's story, or this gets deeper, when you hear the story about the alien ship landing um, with the, the kids, the, all the, the kids at the school in, uh, in Africa, happened in Australia too, um, where you had like literally dozens and dozens and dozens of eyewitnesses in broad daylight. And these kids have grown up and their story stays exactly the same. Like they tell you exactly the same story. This is what happened that day. This is what we saw. There was no mass hypnosis, none of that stuff. They had an actual physical encounter with something that was out of this world. Um, now do I think it was demonic? Yeah, I think it was demonic, but, um, like you can't just simply say it didn't happen. Dismiss it. Like, you, you have interaction with actual at yeah. high points, physical <laughs> objects. So I do believe that it's demonic, but I don't know to what degree the demonic can influence the physical world to even manipulate space and time and matter with like these vehicles. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't really have an answer to that, but I think it is demonic, but I think we have to have a better answer than it's just demons or people are deluded. No, people are, people are really, really interacting with things. I'll give you one example with that. Um, when I first moved to Arizona, the Phoenix lights mm. situation happened. Um, and it was all over the news and everybody in Phoenix knew about it. Um, actually I live now right where it happened. Um, and I remember at the time it was like 96 or 97, I think it was when it happened. At the time when it happened, like, you know, we had some footage and it was like, yeah, what in the world is that? But our governor actually the next day, you can watch all this in the testimonies. It's like our governor the next day came out mocking it. Like he came out with like a guy dressed like an alien laughing about it because everyone thought this, well, what is this ship that's flying over Phoenix? And uh, he came out laughing about it, but he comes out later and he tells now today, he says, like, it was real. And like, we came out so that no one would freak out. I came out with a fake alien because like, we didn't want anybody to panic. He said, but in reality, we had radar stuff of it. We, we knew that this was not ours. And he said, like, I, I, he kind of apologizes to the public. Like I was deluding the public to not freak anybody out. Wow. There's uh, evidence of, um, uh, air traffic control conversation. I think, uh, uh, who's the guy in, uh, hateful eight, uh, Kurt, is it Kurt, um, Kurt Russell, Kurt Kurt Russell. Russell. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was him, right? He was flying into Phoenix. Someone famous. I, I'm, for some reason, I'm thinking of him. Huh. Look on YouTube. You find this. Um, I think it was him flying into Phoenix when the Phoenix lights happened. Really? And uh, I think he calls to radio the traffic control. And he's like, uh, what's this like off to my right? What is this? Oh, he was literally flying. You can the hear the you can hear the air traffic control. Like I see there's oh, some, wow. there's there's something over here. The, there were people in all of Phoenix that testified. That was him. I mean, loads loads of them that testified yeah. especially in my neighborhood they oh, have a documentary sure. of this yeah. my neighborhood where it was yeah uh, they said that they were underneath this dark triangle shaped ship that was ginormous and it was completely silent and it hovered over the neighborhoods low slow and, it, and they have the radar tracking of it it went from all the way to that point and it went all the way like north it was it was tracked all the way almost across our state uh-huh. So, okay. Situation like that. You can't say as a Christian, don't, don't, I think we should do, we should be careful. Like to, to, we don't want to look like idiots. 
Don't be a buffoon. If you've got thousands of eyewitnesses, radar uh, evidence and air traffic control, like this thing was in our sky and it went across silently, defied the laws of physics and the skills we have now to do this. It went across the city of Phoenix. There's evidence in the air, on the ground, radar evidence. It went all the way north. When you see something like that, you can't just sim simply say, dismiss it. I don't want to think about it. No, you better think about it because guess what the world's doing with it? They're creating an entire worldview out of it saying, yeah, there is no God. We all evolved just like creatures on other planets. And they're just arriving here. That's where they're from. There is no God. There is, that's where it always gets, right? There is no God. We don't need God anymore because aliens. So you have to have an answer. And I think you're right. Some of this may be military technology we don't know about. And then yeah. some of it might just be demonic but we don't know like to what extent demons can manipulate the physical world. Yeah. So, so three things, number one, it was Kurt Russell and it is on YouTube. Um, second thing is the triangle thing in high school. I had a kid who showed me a picture on a flip phone of a, of an object like that. He said he was out in the middle of nowhere here in Nebraska and uh, took the picture on his flip phone. I saw it now, of course, um, could be true. Could could be he got the image off of Google, whatever. But I have seen a picture uh, similar to kind of what you described. It's almost like the ships on Star Wars underneath, like when you're yeah. looking up. Yeah. And then uh, third thing, um, I just read uh, Matthew McConaughey's book Green Lights, and so I've been I've been watching every Matthew McConaughey movie in order because I like his movies. <laughs> and then the one I'm about to watch next is Contact. Are you are either one of you familiar with that movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I, that, that's kind of his thing where he's like, I, I've never seen it, but you know, he talks about in the book, he was Jody interested, Foster, right? Yeah. He mm. says in the book, he was interested in it because he gets to play a scientist who's a Christian and, and McConaughey considers himself a Christian and says that, uh, you know, he doesn't believe in throwing science away. He believes that science can help prove God. And that's yeah. why he chose that role because he could have chosen any, it was right after a time to kill came out and he could have chose any role he wanted and he just chose that one specifically for that. So I might end up watching that tonight. Did he yeah, say go. that uh, Jesus is all right, all right, all right, <laughs> yeah. all right, all right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carl Sagan. I, I oh, is that Carl? That's Carl Sagan's story. Contact is Carl Sagan's story. And yeah. obviously, oh, I didn't know that. Carl Sagan, you know, said we're all stardust and the cosmos is all there is, <laughs> was, or ever will be, I think is what he said. And so he writes Contact. And that's really the, the theme of Contact is that we're in this cosmos that's just constantly evolving but we're like a newer species in this ancient species that's so far away is trying to communicate so that we can build technology to communicate back with them and uh but that's but that's the summary like when the world gets a hold of the ufo and alien story they say okay there is no god we're just all evolving there are things that are higher evolved than us and we're going to make contact with them. Maybe they're trying to make contact with us now. That's what they do with it. So there's no need for Christ. There's no need for the gospel. No need for the word of God. That's where it always goes. Even Dawkins. And Dawkins. Yeah. yeah. Dawkins in the, what was it called? Um, that movie. With Ben uh, Stein. Oh ben Stein's gosh. film. What is that called? Ben, we love that Yeah, film. that was a great movie. Ben Stein's film. Introduced to John Lewis. Dawkins, uh, when he gets pressed on it, that's what he says. Maybe we were, we were seated here called? by an alien life. And you're that's also that, the debate documentary, right? That's not what you're talking about. No, this like, is uh Ben. Oh my God. Ben Stein did a up. film. Now it's driving me crazy. Uh, and it was expelled. on the existence expelled. of God. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. On the yeah. existence of God. And yeah. And Dawkins gets pressed on the issue because are you talking about things like, you know, there is like data and information and in human DNA. You can't get around that. Like you can't get around the information there. All the evidence points to the designer. Of course, of course, of course. Um, and so like he gets pressed to finally just saying, well, maybe we're seated here by an alien life form. Yeah. And by the way, that is a very, very popular, uh, UFO alien sort of worldview view is that the idea is that, you know, they, some even name like Anunnaki and, you know, planet X and things like that, Nibiru, like there are, you know, they're closest to us. And so they came here a long time ago and they seated us here to watch us evolve and uh because they can't get away from the design aspect they can't, can't answer that you can't but that's how they come that's yeah. how they come down on it. they're like well maybe it was the anunnaki and the nibiru and all this stuff and like yeah. they're coming back now to they keep coming back to check on us and they're watching us evolve like we're this grand experiment from this ancient 
like uh, alien civilization. Um, and that's that's who we are. So get away, every single time it's like take away, take away God, take away Christ, take yeah. away the word of God. That's where it goes. So my point is, especially now, like even recently with Congress releasing some information of alien contact and contact with UFOs and those sorts of things. Christians need to develop a very, very robust response to this that doesn't just dismiss like a hundred kids. All their testimonies have been exactly the same for the last 20 years or more. That yeah. and there's adults there too, like that that had an interaction with this otherworldly thing in broad daylight at a school. And it didn't just happen there. I believe it was Africa, but it happened in Australia as well. And, uh, you know, you can't wave the hand at these things because even using biblical standards of evidence, some of the stuff you got to listen to. Well, and I want to say, you know, it's like I would say like, hey, Chris, all Christians listening, don't be afraid to dive headfirst into, into aliens and study it and come up with an answer. But I kind of walked away from the faith for a while because I couldn't fit the ancient astronaut theory, you know, is that when I was in high school and probably just looking for an excuse to walk. And, um, that one was, was basically, I remember one day thinking like, I think I don't believe in God. I think, I think like I actually believe in, in these, in this ancient aliens theory. And when I became a Christian and, and, or I should, I don't know, born again, Christian, I kind of had to go back and say, cause I had this doubt in my mind. It was always in the back of my mind. And I actually had to kind of deal with it head on and go back and study and find people who actually debunk the ancient astronaut theory. Uh, which can be debunked, but yeah, if you're, if you're a mature Christian, um, you know, don't, don't turn away from it. And, and um, kind of like with what you're saying, Jeff, you know, I'm interested in finding out more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. I want to have a good robust answer. I'll just say this final thing on it. Like to what degree is the spiritual creature, like an angel and even a fallen angel, a demon able yeah. to interact in the physical world? Well, you have angels appearing in the old Testament and new, and they have actual physical interaction with people, even eating with people, yeah. um, physically touching people. So yeah, you guys have had manifestations in your, in when you guys were in Hawaii, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, yeah. yeah. That's another thing too. Yeah. Like we know people who have been like demonically oppressed and they have like cuts and marks over their body. So they're able, obviously they're able to physically interact with people to the point of even injuring them. Uh, you see evidence of that in the New Testament and in possession and throwing people into the fire and all that stuff. So there's just questions I have in terms of like angelology and demonology, like to what degree can the spiritual creature like an angel or a demon interact in the physical world? I don't exactly think we have a comprehensive answer to that that would necessitate just going it must be an alien species. It's like, no, no, actually the Bible gives you quite a bit on angelology and demonology. Like there's some so, interaction physically that, so to what degree? And I don't know. I'll tell you this. I, I was doing a job interview once with a guy for a sales position and he, uh, he was, um, he had applied and he grew up as a missionary and I did not want to talk about sales at all. Cause he grew up in uh, the Philippines and I was like, Hey, I know that you got to have some pretty rad stories in the Philippines. And I was like, you got to tell me, dude, come on. And he was like, I will tell you these stories, but it can't affect, you know, the, the job interview in and of itself. And he's like, and I will not tell anybody else in this building. And I was like, I promise you, this will not hurt your job, your chances of the job. <laughs> and I was like, you got to tell me. So he told me some, some pretty wild stories of manifestations and things like that. And I did hire him. So it did not, uh, it did not negatively <laughs> impact him, but, uh, but yeah, there's definitely some cowabunga stuff out there with, mm -hmm. with all that. Now this kind of ties directly. By into the way, Zim if anyone looks it up, Zimbabwe, the Zim school was in Zimbabwe. Uh. That is a fascinating, you have to wait. If you haven't listened to it yet, listen to it. Like it happened a long time ago. There was a lot of witnesses and those, all those people are growing up now. They still have exactly the same story. They're like, yeah, wow. that's what happened. So to tie the room together like a fine rug, will there be aliens in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think it, it it's interesting to think about if you're in heaven right now that Satan, I believe, still has the ability to go into heaven, right? Like in Job. In terms of access, like to converse with God and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, like he has access. He's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, hey, that's the thing, too, with it. Like, when we think about heaven, we think about heaven as a location. Like, right. where is heaven? The Bible would, I mean, God is omnipresent, so he exists everywhere at all times. 
he is covenantally active and very present, but he's also um, omnipresent. He's, he's, he's yeah. everywhere at all times. And so like heaven, isn't just a, a place like out there, like what are its coordinates, but it's also, it's a person like it's, it's God. God is the heaven in its presence. Yeah. And so um, it's not merely location. So yeah, I think the story of Job where Satan is, is before God uh, disputing for Job or against Job um, yeah, there seems to be some present ability to access and even converse with God. Yeah. And the devil, uh, the devil appears as an angel of light. Yeah. So he's able to deceive people right. by, uh, his appearance. Uh, so much of these alien stories sort of seem to intersect with some of that thinking. Um, so yeah, I think well, it's a, it's a work in progress in terms of like, you rather, you better find a way to answer it. So psychedelics, you know, um, that's another thing where it's weird because um, you said before how people who do DMT, for as an example, multiple times start to have where the being that they see suddenly becomes scary and it starts Various. to become a more more tormenting um, experience. Uh, the dude from Tool, he's talked to Joe Rogan about that, how, you know, he doesn't think people should just hop right into the, the deep end of the pool there. And um, I've always... I. I, it's one of those things where on one hand, it's like, what would that be like? Like everything I know about God and, and the Bible and this and the spiritual aspect, you know, it's like, what if we took DMT? I would imagine that, that might be pretty scary for us, you know, because so. Jeff, with your ministry, I'm sure there's plenty of demons who know who Jeff Durbin is. Oh, they know us for sure. You know, so it's like, that might be terrifying. Well, I've, thought, I've, I've had exactly that thought. Actually, recently yeah. we were talking about, we were talking about this recently with uh, leadership career, right? with the seals. Oh yeah. Yeah. Even then, yeah. Uh, we were talking about right, DMT about and we were talking about exactly this thing, how people, ha- I, th- I think I personally, here's my view on DMT. I personally think that DMT does something that um, tears a hole, opens up the spiritual with the physical. I think yeah. it, it does something. Cause like, think about it. We're a physical being with also a spiritual component living in a physical world with spiritual components as well. Heaven and earth were once together, never forget. Sin has corrupted that relationship between heaven and earth, of course. And so to, but it hasn't abolished the spiritual or the physical. So I do think the way people describe their experiences with DMT and the sort of contact they make on the other side, I do think that there's something about that chemical in the human body that does somehow open up that realm. Now that's not far-fetched because uh, Deuteronomy 18 is an explicit warning against practices that will tear a hole and will open up communication between you and the other side. So it's it's known that there are substances and things that open up this realm. And so I think DMT does that, the way people describe those, those experiences. Um, and I had exactly the conversation. I think that if a Christian who truly knows Christ is in Christ and forgiven and saved, engages in a practice like that, I think you should be really careful. Mm. Like, in other words, don't do it. But I think you should be really aware of the fact that like, like you said, like that nefarious aspect people describe down the, down the road somewhere. I've been doing this, you know, five times and then it started to get scary because something started talking to me and clearly wanted my life. Um, I think that would probably be like day one for the believer who knows Christ or maybe even for the demons that are like constantly after us, <laughs> um, like opening up that portal would be like, Hey, welcome. Oh, dude. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I, I, I imagine I've thought about, it. it gives me chills to think about doing that. And then just it going black. And just the first thing you hear is you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> like, uh-huh. That's yeah. exactly. I can imagine. What I, can I would imagine. imagine. Mm-hmm. Be like, the the, the the psychedelic thing is odd how so many people are advocating for it in the mental health oh, yeah. the micro micro dosing you know mushrooms or whatever and 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 some people it's hard to argue with the people who are having they're saying hey you know i was depressed and, and i'm happy now or uh navy so eddie gallagher like i believe he's a christian but i think he's talked about doing like psych- a, lot, psychedelic. a lot of the seals have dealt with a, like identity issues when they get out doing yeah. that stuff yeah you can have, yeah i mean i'm so, gonna use bathroom okay, so you can, you're good you're good but yeah it's like um you know they, they do these treatments and they come out saying that they you know feel feel better it makes me wonder if that's temporary you know five or ten years down the road 
um, you know, they're not going to have that same feeling. Mm. Maybe it brings some kind of moment of peace. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on that, Luke? Or, you know what I'm well, yeah, about? I mean, ultimately there's no lasting joy in there or with yeah. that. Um, I mean, I've been watching, I've, I've found myself recently going down the rabbit hole of, uh, interviews with ex seals and, and military members and stuff. Uh, that was a couple of podcasts I've really gotten into. And yeah, like I said, a number of them. I mean, a, a lot of those guys, when they come out, like when they retire from, from the military, they're, they have major identity issues because they're trained killers yeah. and the skills that they excel at who they, what they find their identity and all of a sudden are not needed necessary nor even welcomed in civilian life, you know? And so they just find themselves just major identity issues and, and just feeling useless and stuff like that. And a lot of those guys, I've been, I've watched a ton of these interviews where they just, there's actual, there's actually some guy, there's a guy, I can't remember what his name is, but there's a guy that was a seal or something that he does this whole course with DMT in Mexico. These guys go to, you know, and like in the, yeah. in the military, like you don't talk about nothing, you know, spiritually or how you're feeling or, you know, you just get, get the work done. Yeah, then, I think uh, Eddie Gallagher went to that one specifically. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I know who Eddie is too, and uh, I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. Um, and yeah, they like they start doing these things, and all of a sudden, like they're finding some sort of healing. It's, I mean, literally, it's just the, a lot of it. I think it's just they actually just talk about their feelings, you yeah. know. But oh, they, yeah, but they can't they can't do that without like breaking down the barrier, you know. Yeah. So a lot of these guys, like all of a sudden, like they find what they've been looking for because they find some sort of healing. Um, and uh, there's one guy in particular, his name is McCall Vega. That's not his birth name. He changed his name, but he's like a shaman or something in this stuff now and was a Navy SEAL, all that. Um, he actually was a producer for Call of Duty and stuff uh, as well. But uh, yes. Um, yeah. So he, uh, he talks about it. And it's interesting because you hear him talk about like he was raised in a Baptist church, I think. So he had this, you know, understanding of God and the Trinity and all this stuff. And, and he talks about when he's a kid, he's like, I just never, he's like, I always just felt like, uh, like there wasn't a division between me and God, you know, but like they, that's all they ever talked about was this divide, you know, the need to be bridged and stuff. And, you know, through DMT and through all the stuff he's doing, like it's all oneness it's all one is because he's like, now I'm feel I'm one with God. Like, you know, like it's, it's yeah. just, so there's, there's no, no division anymore. It's, and so it gets into what you're saying though, because there's a spiritual realm. All of a sudden these guys feel like they're one with whatever nature or whatever it is in God, you know, and um, it's obviously a false religion. And, uh, but yeah, and that's a good question. I mean, at some point, oh, man, I, I would think at some point it's, it, get it's got to get dangerous you know yeah but who knows i don't i mean there's, it's not lasting that's for sure so i know a guy who's a close family friend who dabbled with uh some psychedelics and uh completely fried his brain hasn't been the same since and i wow. think is literally like in a mental institution as we speak because of oh, the wow. breakdown he had and his family said like it's it's due to that um do you hey have you did you listen to the sean ryan show is that one of that's the what i'm you? talking about yeah jeff yeah. got me hooked on it have you listened to the Ed Calderon episode? I uh, not yet. Not that. Oh, one. dude, you guys gotta listen to Ed Calderon because do you know who he is? I just saw his name, but I don't know who he is. He's been on Joe Rogan and stuff. He he was okay. like Mexico Mexico uh, Special Forces, I think. Oh, is he um, the cartel guy? Yeah, but he yeah, goes yeah, into yeah, okay. that, and he yeah. goes into some wild stuff with like okay. what the cartel believes uh, religiously and stuff. I wanted to I want to ask you guys this one because it's it's pressing for me personally. I got two boys. I got a one year old and a, a three year old soon to be four. Um, I want to homeschool my kids. Um, Apology at Church has been a has been very influential on me kind of ch wanting to do that actually. Uh, so I was going to see do you guys have books and and materials that uh, that you guys used uh, because Jeff specifically with you man it's like it seems like your kids all grew up strong in the faith and continue to be believers. And that's not the case with a lot of pastors and, and well-known pastors. And so I would love to know kind of how you did that and, and what, what you used along the way. Yeah. Um, 
it's different. Like Luke, it's different for you, Luke, different for me, different for everybody. I think one of the benefits of homeschooling is that you can, you can specialize. Um, you can right. focus on what, what each kid like education really used to emphasize, uh, specializing yep. and mastery and, uh, not just sort of like, uh, you know, c- commit to taking data in and then dumping data out on a test sort of a thing, but like more mastery and specialize. Like if you're, if your kid's not wanting to be an astronaut, then why are you trying to make them right. a master of, you know, calculus and all these advanced, you know, uh, forms of arithmetic, um, like they need to, they need to know their math and be good at math and they need to have yeah. the ba- basics down. But like, why, why do we treat every child in a system? Like they need to, uh, they need to all emphasize specialty in, in every single area. I think that's, it's, it's weird, uh, to do that, but that's how our school system works in many ways. And so, um, you can specialize and there's a number of different, uh, programs you can go through, like, Classical, I think, is the most comprehensive and uh, probably the thing that's going to get the most full orbed um, Christian worldview training and rigorous training. It's not for everybody. Some people don't yeah. feel like they, they can manage that. Some homeschool moms really struggle with classical education. It takes education. a lot for the, the homeschool moms. To yeah, a lot of homeschool moms are like, I just, I would love to do it. I cannot do it. I have four kids I'm homeschooling and I can't manage the classical curriculum. Uh, there's a million programs you can choose from. Some of them are even free. Um, and so I would say you really, you and your wife need to talk about what works best for her in the home and with the kids. Uh, but it's, you're giving them a Christian worldview education. That means you're teaching them history. And, and with, on that note, I will say what I highly recommend must be done by every Christian family is do Dr. George Grant's uh, history curriculum. That's I think for eighth grade to 12th grade area. It's in that realm. Um, it's like, uh, modernity, it's American history. It's, uh, you know, Christian history. It's, it's, it's amazing. Nothing better. Cause you're going to get sort of like theology, philosophy, worldview stuff in with history. And, uh, Dr. George Grant is just, he's my favorite. He's a beast. He's a beast. And you need to have your kids do that. It's uh King's Meadow, mm. Dr. George Grant King's Meadow. Don't neglect that for your older kids. They need to go through that entire thing. Cause they're going to get so, so much in one single program. I mean, you're getting philosophy, theology, history all together in one. Uh, so I think it really depends on, on, you really got to dabble a bit and see like, well, what will work best for us? Um, but you know, it's one of the things that's important when you, when you talk about raising your kids in a nurture and admonition of the Lord and pouring into them, it's important that the gospel is first and foremost mm-hmm. center. Like you can give a person a Christian worldview and it could mean nothing if their heart is, is their heart's not new, if their mind isn't new, right? Like Jesus in his inner circle, he taught and raised up disciples in his inner circle, the 12, and they got teaching from the master, from Jesus himself. And yet one of them was a devil, received the same theological training, but it was up to the sovereign grace of God to save. Mm. Now, so remember that's really important. I think for parents to realize that like you are being faithful to God, you're loving your kids by giving them the truth of God, giving them a full orb Christian worldview, but the gospel has to always be center. And you have to always remember that it's up to the sovereign will of God, whom God saves. Um, and so, you know, I think parents need to keep that in mind because, you know, I, I know of a recent situation of, of, a, of somebody raised in a Christian home and a solid Christian home with two believing parents who raised this person, uh, this girl, under solid Christian teaching and under the hearing of the gospel. And now she's older and she has decided to depart from it and uh, to abandon Christ. I mean, to abandon even her profession. And I wouldn't want those parents to feel like, look, you did something wrong. Like, I know these parents. Yeah, I know they raised her under the hearing of the gospel. I know they raised her with the word of God. I know they even homeschooled her. And, uh, and it was a huge, great, beautiful benefit uh, that hopefully this season will be over for her soon. But the point is, is, is um, you don't want to put the blame on the parents in a situation like that, like you didn't do enough. It's, uh, it's yeah. ultimately up to the sovereign grace of God because never forget that Judas betrayed Jesus. That's uh, yeah. And I was sorry, just to add to that, uh, one thing I always recommend, because we get asked this a lot, and like like Jeff was saying, to be honest, there's so many things out there. That's what's great about homeschooling is you can tailor it 
to what your kids' needs are and their learning style. We always recommend, we did always recommend going to a homeschool convention uh, until they decided that they were going to make us wear masks. That's fun like, to go to. We're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was, it was cool. It's fun. You go and like, um, they have everything. Like if anything homeschool related is there, you can go, you can touch it. You can smell it. You can examine it. You can talk to the people, you know what I mean? And so like, that was always helpful because you could, you know, just figure out what you wanted to use. You can piecemeal stuff if you want. You don't have to use one whole curriculum. Um, so yeah. And it's fun going to those too today because it's such a broad spectrum of people. Yeah. Oh, like you'll see. Oh yeah. <laughs> you'll see you'll see the pe- people you typically think are in our homeschool <laughs> like you know blue dr- blue jean dresses all the way down to yeah. the toes yeah. and you know and you know uh head covering head coverings and and you're like well that makes sense and that now the homeschooling community is so huge like that convention is always so fun to go to because you see like this broad spectrum of like it looks like the pilgrims showed up to like <laughs> Luke's Luke's walking around looking like a gangster hell's angel <laughs> biker. And uh but there's yeah. there's a lot of people like that though. Yeah. We, I remember when we went, we were like, oh, we're not the only ones. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. How you guys doing on time? Because if you got some time, I want to ask about the Black Road Regiment. Uh I do have to go soon. Yeah, I do too, actually. Yeah. Maybe we can say that for another show. Maybe another yeah. show. Because that would be an awesome topic to get into. Heck yeah. We'll we'll we'll, we'll wrap this one up. Um, I appreciate you guys coming. I appreciate everybody listening. Well, I can't thank those two enough for coming on again. And thank you to everybody who's listening. And I ask you to please continue to listen because I have uh, some very important messages uh, for the work that Luke and Jeff are doing right now. Um, Like I said, they're very busy guys. Everybody... I think who's involved with Apologia is a busy person. Um, And I'm not sure if it's actually Apologia or Apologia. Sometimes they say Apologia, but I'm going to keep saying Apologia. Apologia was started in Tempe, Arizona. Um, They've got multiple locations, including Utah and Kauai. So um, they do Apologia Studios, which produces Apologia Radio and uh, Coltish, those two shows specifically. I've been listening to a lot for a long time. Um, they also have uh, Sheologians and Provoked. But I think, uh, not just I think, one of the most important things that Apologia Church is involved in is trying to stop the murder of babies. Um, right now, with their uh, with their organization, End Abortion Now, you can go to endabortionnow.com. Um, they are trying to put a full stop to the murder of babies. Um, Roe versus Way. Regardless of how that goes um, in the Supreme Court right now, uh, this stuff is still actually going to matter. It does not just start and stop with Roe versus Wade. Um, right now, End Abortion Now has 16 to 18 states that are putting the Abolish Abortion Bill into their state legislature, which is a bill of uh, equal protection. Um, so right now, they're trying to get the word out. Um, there's a lot that goes on with lobbying and um some of the stuff that goes on with pro with the uh, pro life industry, we will say, um, you know, I don't know what to think about it. Listen to listen to uh, you know Luke and Jeff talk about it. They know a lot more about it than I do, but it's pretty eye opening. Um, but uh, they are what Luke and Jeff are basically trying to do is spread the gospel as God commands um, that we do not kill any human being, any image bearer of God, um, these innocent babies. And so right now, um, they've just got a lot going on. They're, they're going to need some funding. I, my understanding of it, hopefully I'm not getting this wrong, is that if they hit a certain uh, dollar figure, they're going to have a donor match that. So this is huge stuff. Please check out End Abortion Now. Um, as far as everything else that they are involved with, there's more. Um, redstatereform.org, standwithwarriors.org. Uh, just trying to stand with uh, people in the military right now who are maybe being forced to do certain things that they don't want to do. Check out the websites to find out more. Again, check out the show notes. You'll find links to everything that I'm talking about. You'll find all of the books that were referenced today at bookbrilliant.com. Again, thank you, Luke and Jeff. Thank you to everybody at Apologia. Um, I think what they're doing is pretty brave, and uh, I pray that they keep doing it. Thanks, guys.